Hello everyone, welcome to today's uh, Ruby Forum luncheon. We have with us our special guest, Yigal Schleffer. Uh, Yigal is a Washington-based journalist and analyst covering Turkey. He's also the co-founder of Istanbul Eats, a blog covering Istanbul's authentic dining scene and the author of The Turcophile, a blog about Turkish foreign and domestic affairs on EurasiaNet.org. He was based in Istanbul between 2002 and 2010 where he worked as a correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor and the English language service of the German press agency DPA. Welcome, Miguel. Thanks for having me. You have this, uh, I guess really in terms of themes, there couldn't be uh, two nicer themes that I would like to cover and usually we cover uh, different uh, types of, of talks, <coughs> particularly in, in, in DC, which is very uh, policy-based, geopolitical-based, etc. So we, we, we cover some of those types of themes within the broader concept of, you know, cultural understanding and, and, and dialogue. Uh, but someone of Turkish background, food in Istanbul, uh, two of my favorite topics and they've come together here in this book so maybe yeah. you can give yeah. us a, a brief intro. Definitely. Um, first of all, thanks for having me here You're most welcome. and um, it's really great to be here. We, I started this with Ansel Mullins who's another American uh, who's uh, still in Istanbul and uh, we started this in 2009 in April and uh, the idea was, um, I'm a journalist and, and in many ways I, my work as a journalist is an excuse to find places to eat. I mean, I just kind of like to, you know, and and really, you know, wherever I go, and I used to, I used to work in New York, and sort of I, I worked for a year at the New York Post as a, as a at the beginning of my career, and and you know, sort of I was on the murder and mayhem beat, kind of covering all over the, going all over New York City, and and a lot of times it was just used for sort of finding little places to eat, and it was the same thing in Istanbul, and other parts of Turkey, you know, traveling through th Southeast Turkey, covering the Kurdish issue, was always in a way also a great chance to sort of try amazing local. Um, foods and learning about local culture. Um, so we uh, were talking about Istanbul and uh, an article had come out in one of the American papers sort of about what to see in Istanbul and it talked about restaurants and it just listed all the sort of typical touristic places that people go to and I'd found I mean, my own experience with Istanbul was it's such an amazing place to eat. But I kept encountering people who said to me, you know, I didn't really have good food there. You know, and, and a lot of times I thought it was because of articles like this that sort of kept sending people to the same old place that had gotten used to the tourists coming and were just basically mm -hmm. taking advantage of them. And we thought, well, it would be really nice to just start writing about places that we like to eat at. So thus, a blog was born called IstanbulEats.com. And um, we were just, yeah, writing about authentic back streets, very local places that we like to eat at. But I think as, as the blog grew, I mean, we, f we quickly saw that we were filling a vacuum. People really were interested in this information, really wanted to know. Uh, Istanbul is such an amazing, rich, diverse city and has, the, you know, the culinary history is so interesting. Um, you know, we saw that it was more than just about where to get, you know, a nice lunch mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of where to go stuff your face, you know. It was, it was, it was really, we were sort of creating a kind of, uh, oral history of the city in the sense mm. of, you know, consuming. Um, but, you know, we realized it, Istanbul has such a rich history, you know, all the cultures have come through, Roman, Greek, Byzantine, Arab, Persian. Um, and then more recently, you've had this incredible migration from all across Turkey, all the different regions coming through. So the food of Istanbul was really telling the story of the city, and it was telling the story of migration and the story of displacement and the story of war. You know, the, uh, the, the Turks from the Balkans who came to the city, you know, let's say around World War I and, 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 and sort of set up there, and the food that they were still creating, um, mm. you know, told, told you a certain story. You know, the, the minorities of, of Istanbul, the, the Greeks and the Jews and Armenians and their places and the stories that they told. Um, uh, you know, so, and then, of course, the regional diversity of Turkey that now is represented in Istanbul. So you have food from the Black Sea, which is very interesting, and we can talk more about that. I mean, but it's a very particular kind of cuisine, or the food from the Southeast, you know, which is more influenced by Syria and the Middle East and has more of, an, let's say, an Arab influence. Um, so, you know, you could sort of, in a certain way, travel through all of Turkey without leaving Istanbul by going to those restaurants of all these different regions. So, you know, we realized there was something a lot more here than, you know, just where to get, you know, your next meal. Mm. Uh, so, and that in Istanbul, you know, there's a lot more happening, as we say, beyond the kebab. You know, there's really, 
uh, just really a lot there. So that's that was the start, and mm -hmm. uh, and as it grew, you know, we sort of got more interested in the stories of of the people making the food. You know, we found that you know there's this concept in Turkish usta, which is master, right? And you know. Uh, everyone's an usta, but only a few are real ones. And you know the stories of these masters, ustas who are making kofte, which is you know meatballs or uh, you know things that are more complex. But they all had really interesting stories to tell. And uh, you know just a few examples. I mean, you, there's uh, we kofte, which is Turkish grilled meatballs. We, I think, if you do Google Istanbul and kofte, we come up first now, I think, because we've written so much about kofta. I mean, we're, we're probably like leading experts on mm. grilled meatballs at this point. <laughs> but you know, you can get quite into it. You know, there's this kind and this kind. And, but you know, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's sort of part of the fun of the job. But um, you know, there's one place that we wrote about called Philippe Kofte, which is near, um, near the old train station in, uh, on the European side. And the guy, the usta, the grill master, he's, uh, he's been there, I think, for over 30 years. And the waiter, you know, the waiter calls the grill master the young one because the waiter has been there for over 40 years, you know. And it's just the kind of thing that here, at least in the United States, is very hard to find, you know, a guy who's flipping meatballs for more than 30 years. But he really, you know, he said, you know, th this is my life. I'm, I take a lot of pride in what I do, you know. It's, and, and I think there's something very beautiful in that and it's, it's something in Istanbul you find that a lot mm -hmm. hard to find in other places you know so that's part of what we were also trying to do celebrate people like that and then not about setting up chains and things like that well so as so the blog grew and then mm -hmm. it turned into a book uh, sort of a year into it we thought uh, okay we have enough material here for a book so we mm -hmm. approached a Turkish publisher called Boyut um, which does very nice books a lot on travel and food also and uh, Put, it t put the material together into a book um, that, that has done quite well. Um, and then uh, somebody we know suggested, you know, you should, said you should think about doing tours or walks. So we sort of looked at different routes that we were taking. We ourselves were kind of going on, you mm -hmm. know, just sort of areas of the city that we thought were undiscovered and had lots of little interesting stories to tell and started putting together these culinary walks. So we now have four different routes that we do. Um, and those are similar to what we do with the blog, which is the idea is to tell a story. Again, it's not just about sort of taking you from point A to point Z, because there really are a lot of stops along the way of these walks, uh, and just kind of, you know, stuffing your face at each spot and trying, you know, the idea is to really kind of have a narrative to, to these walks and really kind of, so you know, we have one walk that we call uh, Culinary Secrets of the Old City, which really takes people sort of through these back streets of, of the old city, I think to parts where most people wouldn't get to on their own. And it really tells a story of, 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 of this area of, of town and a lot of the artisanal food makers are still there. For example, we, uh, we take people to a candy shop where it's, it's fourth, third or fourth generation. I mean, they date back, they date back to Ottoman times that so they've been mm -hmm. making sweets, Turkish delight and other sweets, really very traditional way. And they're in this very sweet old shop and a grandfather is there. It's three generations working in the shop right mm -hmm. now. Um, things like that or to old, we also take people to old Hans, you know, old Karvan Sarai's that, that are still in the area. Um, a, a more Kurdish neighborhood. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really a, a story, you know, it tells a story also. These walks tell a story. And, um, and more recently, we've launched a new site uh, called culinarybackstreets.com, uh, where we're hooking up with uh, bloggers and writers in other cities and other countries where we're trying to do something similar. So we have Athens, Barcelona, Shanghai, Mexico City right now, where we're doing something similar, trying to write about the, the culinary backstreets of those cities and authentic, mm -hmm. traditional food makers um, and the idea is also where right now we, we have walks also in Shanghai the people we're working with there are, are offering culinary walks and then in the spring we'll be adding Athens and probably Barcelona also doing these kinds of culinary walks that are you know sort of narrative driven culinary mm -hmm. walks. Now when I said China I was referring to actually people now the American concept is once you're onto a good thing sell it, mass produce it, yes. set, set up shop uh, elsewhere, yes, yes. but you're talking about three, four generations in the one shop. Right, exactly. Don't you think about setting up a second shop, making it bigger, a national brand, international brand? Yeah. So what is it about? Is it a Turkish psyche? Is it about... I, you know, I think, I, you know, it's like I said, it's this guy, I think there's this kind of pride in, um, you know, it's like this cuff to this kofta maker, right? I mean, you know, he's been doing this for 30 years. And I think there's a kind of pride in doing something right. I think there's a, there's a pride in tradition. Um, I think there's a respect, you know, I mean, I think someone like him earns respect, even though he's not maybe making tons of money mm -hmm. by 
grilling meatballs. I think he gets a lot of respect for doing it really well. And, you know, they have their regulars like who come in. Like an artist and a masterpiece. Yeah, it is like an artist. I mean, I, I was in Istanbul a few weeks ago um, and was in a neighborhood called Besiktas, which is, you know, not a very touristy area. It's actually not very touristy at all. Um, but it's a great place for eating because it's a very traditional neighborhood and there's a lot of wonderful spots. And there was a guy there he, who makes doner. Doner is, you know, people know doner. It's the shawarma and call it in the Middle East. Anyways, you know, it's the, the, the mi meat on a spit. And he... Um, <coughs> This guy's well known for making one that's, you know, really bulbous, massive. Uh, but he builds it every morning. So we were there early in the morning and watched him build it, you know, and he was sort of, you know, starts layer by layer of sort of marinated meat. And he was, you know, sort of carving it, shaping it. You know, this is before it was cooked. So it was a big bulbous thing of raw meat, mm -hmm. quite beautiful in a certain way, you know, but, but I mean, he was really just building it. I mean, handcrafted, you know, he does this every morning and mm -hmm. I know it's very beautiful to watch, um, you know, and I, but I have to say on that note, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing is, is to really kind of record and preserve because, you know, I think Istanbul and Turkey in general is at a kind of cusp of you know, moving, it's a developing country. The mm -hmm. economy's developing very quickly. It's modernizing, you know, there's the idea of progress, modernization. So I, the concern is that a lot of these traditions, you know, could get lost, you know, because, you know, people now do want to advance economically. So the idea of, you know, sort of working as a- There are chains, there are dinner chains forming. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, example. so a lot, of, a lot of traditional Turkish foods now are actually, you know, becoming chains and, and are, but you know, so the idea is, you know, sort of does the, does the meatball griller want his son to do that? Probably mm. not. I mean, he wants his son to go to university, become a doctor, a lawyer, I don't know, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, so, you know, so things are it's sort of at a, at a bit of a, you know, a bit of a transition point where a lot of, uh, you know, what were traditional food items and food makers, you know, could get lost. You know, I, when I, I moved to Turkey at the end of 2002 and um, my wife and I, we came together and we were staying in a neighborhood called Gumushsu, which is near, near downtown mm. Istanbul, let's say. And we were staying in the apartment of a friend. It was winter time and it was quite foggy. I remember the fog would come in off the Bosphorus and late at night, or not late at night, but let's say 9, 10 p.m., we would hear somebody walking through the streets clinking glasses or what sounded like glasses and yelling, not yet, you know, sort of shouting out something, which we later found out was boza. Right, boza, clink, 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 boza. And so boza, I, we had no idea what it was. To us it sounded like something out of a horror film, you know, like sort of a scary character walking through the streets, you know, clinking things. But boza is a drink made out of millet, fermented, sort of very lightly fermented, has a very low alcohol, but it's a very traditional, very old sort of Ottoman era thing. Um, and these guys, you know, and, and in winter it's very traditional because in summer it would just ferment very quickly and spoil, but you know, in winter it would, and it's just something fortifying, um, you know, guys like that don't walk around. I mean, there's a few neighborhoods where, but in that neighborhood, certainly that guy no longer walks around, you know. Um, I remember there used to be guys walking around with big baskets on their head filled with sandwiches. You know, they just would go around from shop to shop for selling, you know, things like that are slowly, you know, they're disappearing. So um, what I would very much like to do, you know, and, and, and one of the hopes is what we're doing through these walks and through the book is, is sort of helping capture, you know, the, what some of these people do, and, and in that way, perhaps, you know, helping preserve them. I'll just give an example. Uh, we did a, um, a book launch party when this book came out, uh, and we did a kind of street party in the Galata neighborhood, and we had some street vendors come, and there was a, so as the party was getting going, there was a, a man sort of lurking, I would say, in the background, kind of a bit of an older gentleman, and then finally he came up to me and he said, you know, he said, do you know who I am? And I said, no, I didn't, you know. He says, I'm, my name is Levon. And I, I said, oh, he says, and, and he was the owner of a small restaurant that we'd written about. It's in the book. It's a, a really interesting story. So it, it, it's in a hardware district, very traditional area f that's filled with hardware stores. And, Wh and What area did you say? It's, uh, it's by the Halic, by the Golden Horn. Oh, okay, at the bottom. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, Pesce yeah. yeah. So uh, filled with hardware stores. So he used to ha run a ball bearing shop. Yeah, and then one day his wife, and he, he's an Armenian man, so he, he's you know sort of from this older Istanbul generation of the Armenian community. And one day his wife said to him, "You know what? I'm a very good cook. Let's open up a restaurant. Forget about ball bearings." Okay, so they went from ball bearings to restaurant. They have a restaurant that serves sort of 
lunch for workers in the area. And it's a really wonderful little place. And, and we wrote about them. And, and he came up and said, I just want to let you know that ever since you know, I was on your blog and now in the book, you know, I'm getting Russian, Japanese tourists coming in. You know, it just everything's changed. You know, and it's just wonderful. And now we have a new walking route. And we start, we start it in their place with a breakfast. And she makes these wonderful little sort of pastries, traditional Armenian breakfast pastries. Mm. Um, so it's really made a big difference for them. You know, and uh, so things like that are you know one of the things we'd like to do and and of course there's got to be a lot of it in Istanbul uh, and things that don't make the book are on the blog yeah I mean <coughs> yeah the I mean the book came out and is it getting yeah I mean we're adding we're constantly adding I mean we're, you know we're always sort of I mean you know we're are, we're prejudiced towards older places yeah. and, you know sort of places that have been around family businesses and traditional um, you know kind of generations old places um, but you know when interesting new things come up um, we're happy to write about that too and and you know one of the things that's really interesting right now in Turkey um, is that I think people are rediscovering you know their culinary roots let's mm -hmm. say I think you know for a while there and and I think this mirrors something that's happening perhaps on the political level where you know at one time there was a sense of you know very much looking west and and sort of you know, to be modern meant eating Western cuisine, you know, and I think, and I think now people are really sort of realizing, well, there's a lot that we have to offer, you know, from our own heritage and our own traditions. And so, you know, you have this thing where sort of higher level chefs, you know, sort of in some top end restaurants, you know, which used to do sort of more European style menus are now changing their menus to incorporate Turkish ingredients and actually going very traditional. I, when I was in Istanbul just now, um, I went and had dinner at Mikla, which I don't know if anyone who's been to Istanbul has been there, but it's, it's, a, it's a very high-end restaurant at the top of a fancy hotel in Beolu, run by a chef who's half, well, he grew up partly in Sweden, partly in Turkey. I think his mother's Finnish, his father's Turkish. Anyway, he's a very kind of international type mm. guy. And it used to be a very, the menu was this very kind of European fusion, high-end menu and they've recently completely shifted the menu and it's just a very traditional Turkish menu I mean with a kind of modern spin on things and using sort of you know molecular cooking techniques on some dishes you know things like that but at the end of the day you know the um, the ingredients are very typical Turkish the inspiration is very much uh, the regional cuisine of Turkey so it's very interesting to see that there's another restaurant um, called Lokanta Maya which is in 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 Karakoy which is by the Bosphorus and and there's a, a wonderful chef there a woman chef named uh, Didem who um, you know, is, is, is doing also very kind of very inspired modern takes on traditional Aegean cuisine especially um, so it's very interesting to see that you know the kind of how there's a process, I think, of rediscovery mm. and uh, reclaiming in a certain way of, of, the, of the traditional cuisine. And one thing I didn't come across, but uh, something that is favorite of mine in Istanbul are kind of the, the tea places, the tea houses. Yeah. Uh, they may not necessarily have uh, uh, the best pipe, but they usually have th the ones that I, I get to, like Pierre Lotti, right. uh, have the best views. Yes. So I'm not too sure if you would consider something like that either in a book or, uh, or elsewhere, something where you have a nice coffee. Uh, yeah. Uh, the food may not be the best. Yeah, the it's not really about the food. You've got, well, the, I think you've got a grand view from Suleimani uh, yeah. or Chamlija on the Asian side. Exactly. Well, I think that's, that's one of the beauties <coughs> and I think what makes Istanbul and I think Turkish, you know, parts of Turkish culture uh, so wonderful is this sort of the tea house is a really good representative, of, you know, which is the <coughs> idea that you can sit at this place and really, you know, it's sort of affordable luxury in the mm, sense of, mm. you know, here you are. I mean, these tea houses really do command some of the finest views in the city and you can sit and for a few lira have mm. very well made tea and just sit there and, you know, sort of enjoy life. And, uh, and even getting, for example, I love the walk through the cemetery up to Pier Up to Pier, yeah, exactly. And then you can take the cable car down and continue right. to walk through exactly. the suburbs of Ayub. Exactly. And similarly in Chamlija, the walk to the tea house, etc. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, in the in the book here, one one of the places <coughs> that we write about is not a tea place, but a coffee place, which yeah. I think is sort of the best Turkish coffee maker uh, in Istanbul. And this is a place in Beyoğlu. Um, but again, you know, these are traditions that are endangered. You know, in the mm. sense that you know, this guy, 
you know, he's been doing this for, I don't know, decades also, you know, making, and all, all he does is he makes coffee and he has tea, um, but coffee is his real specialty. And he has a tiny little stall uh, inside. There's a few seats and then most of the seats are outside on, on stools. And he, uh, he takes a lot of pride in what he does. He's not getting rich. You know, he's, he's really working very hard, very long days, you know, but he may be the last, you know, mm. certainly, I mean, I don't see anyone sort of, uh, you know, coming to replace him, uh, you know, so it's, uh, you know, some of these, like I said, you know, some of these traditions are wonderful, but I think care needs to be taken, you know, I would hate to see some of these beautiful tea houses, you know, sort of turned over to who knows what, because, you know, the view is so good, you know, or so uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always a little bit, you know, I, I sort of whenever I, I sit down at one of these tea places, you know, I, I sort of really take in the view because I, I'm worried about, you know, what may come next. Of course, the metaphor, and I, I, I use that like master craftsman, uh, it lasts generations, but with modernization, these may be uh, disappearing. Uh, but similarly, uh, that, that comparison to a Picasso-type artwork, of course, the artwork outlives the, the artist, but when it comes to food, of course, uh, if there is no artisan or, or craftsman beyond, beyond the usta for right. him to uh, have yeah. a, uh, a tradesman or an apprentice next to him, then unfortunately that would pass away with uh, that individual. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's an, it's really interesting if, um, if people who've traveled to Istanbul, and, and, and you probably know this, you know, in, in especially in, in neighborhoods where you have a lot of small shops, there's usually some kind of central tea maker somewhere, <coughs> right, who's networked throughout the neighborhood. Either sometimes they have intercom systems or yes. now they're just using phones. But when people want tea, they, you know, it used to be with intercoms, you know, and they, they, there would be a system of intercoms. You know, it's a kind of a small radius, and this tea guy is responsible for that radius. And, you know, you push the intercom and say, you know, three, four, five teas, however many. And this was his business, you know, and you still have this. And, um, but, you know, and it's an amazing sort of business kind of <coughs> ecosystem to watch operate. Um, but again, you know, these are the kind of things that could very well, you know, in a few years or let's say 10, 15 years, you know, people are going to start maybe using tea bags, heaven forbid, because nobody will do that right now. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe this, this kind of, tea system, you know, might, might I disappear, you know, we hope not, I don't but, you know, so, I mean, it's all, you know, it's also, it's a function of, you know, certain, you know, I mean, the fact that, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of companies or, 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 you know, large offices will have an in-house tea maker, right? You know, somebody who's in charge of making tea and coffee it's occasionally. It's a special position. It's a special position, you know, but you can imagine cost cutting arrives yeah. or who knows. You know, these are, you know, so, you know. First person, uh, yeah, we'll be tea lady. Tea. <laughs> exactly. You know, so, I mean, we hope not, but, you yes. know, these are. I came across a businessman, a small businessman, Esnaf, in uh, between uh, the Musr Chasha, which is a spice market, and the, um, the covered bazaar, uh, and the, he offered. Now of course, it's all to do within the the culture of Turkish hospitality, uh, and similarly to you know the the uh, the passion that these ustas have for their food. Similarly, in terms of s servicing one's customers, etc., within uh, uh, within the business place, he would offer a tea to everybody that stepped in to look at his goods, as uh, I had, I s um, and and it's very common, as, as you would mm -hmm. know. And I said, you know, you must have, uh, you know, a few customers coming through. He goes, I, I, I have at least 40, 50, maybe 60 cups of tea uh, a day. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I don't want to offend anybody, so I drink <laughs> right. when, when they drink. <laughs> so, uh, and similarly, there would be the, the tea person coming yeah. across. He would order two or three right. or five at a time. Yeah, exactly. And uh, go all out uh, with, with the tea. Now, uh, uh, you've mentioned Armenians, but I saw in your book, uh, Uyghurs or Uyghurs, yeah. so if you incorporate, of course, non specifically non-Turkish, but other Turkic or non-Muslim, yeah, Armenian, I mean, Jewish. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, you know, like I said, the, the food, I think, tells a story of Istanbul, and I think, you know, the story today uh, is the story that Istanbul has always been, which is this incredible crossroads. So, um, you know, there's one neighborhood in Istanbul, Zeytin Bornu, which has a lot of Uyghurs coming from, you know, from Western China. Um, you know, some of them are refugees, mm. some of them are, 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 you know, just trying to make a new start, but they've sort of set up. So we, we were exploring that area a bit and, and written a bit about, you know, sort of their cuisine, which is, you know, not so dissimilar from Turkish cuisine, but has, you know, sort of also a more Central Asian influence. So um, that's very interesting. Something we've recently done, uh, Istanbul and, you know, Turkey has become a real 
crossroads for migrants from Africa and, and Iran and, you know, mm. people trying to get to Europe. Mm. And a lot of them end up getting stuck in Istanbul, unable to get into Europe for various reasons, you know. So Istanbul now actually has quite a large migrant community. Africans especially and and others so recently so we we teamed up with IOM the International Organization for Migration and did something uh, that we called Migrant Kitchen which you know just to help Istanbul locals learn a bit about who's living in in their midst right now mm -hmm. because there isn't much interaction so we had an Ethiopian lunch day that we did with an Ethiopian member of the community cooked up a big lunch um, Cameroon mm -hmm. also uh, you know, so you know that would be very different for uh, yeah, very different yeah, for yeah, because you know Istanbul yeah, life. the average Istanbul like, you know, knows nothing you know about Cameroonian cuisine. I mean, most of us probably don't you know. So um, <coughs> so very interesting. So, you know, I, the idea is that the story continues. I mean, it's an old story of Istanbul as this crossroads, mm. and you know, it's usually east west now. It's a bit uh, yeah, north south. north south, and I mean, it's it's kind of all ways you know. Mm. But the idea is to you know still want to tell that story. Mm. Um, so yeah. Exactly. And, and, and what about beyond Istanbul? Uh, of course, this book is about uh, Istanbul itself, and you're talking about other, other cities, but w within the uh, Turkish framework, uh, other areas from southeast Turkey or the Black Sea. I know you've covered yeah. uh, families that have migrated to Istanbul from other areas, but what about those areas themselves? Because Turkey is uh, quite a, an important hub for tourism, so yeah. southeast. And yeah, particularly in Turkey's I mean, my, you know, my I mean, my favorite place in Turkey, food-wise, is Gaziantep, which is southeast Turkey, and it's an amazing. It's sort of a culinary mecca. Yeah. Um, you know, it goes mean, for me as well, from the sweets to the meat dishes. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's you know, it's the best baklava in Turkey, mm. uh, the best kebabs in Turkey. I mean, it's just amazing, and I think you know, uh, so that is 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 a place that that I would love to actually explore more myself. I mean, I've only had a few opportunities mm -hmm. to be there. Um but I think the yeah, the regional diversity is is really quite fascinating. I mean, like I said, you can get a taste of that in in Istanbul, but you know, sometimes it makes sense to to go further out. I mean, the Black Sea, I mentioned that a little bit before, the Black Sea, for example, is, you know, like a completely different you know the the DNA of the cuisine I feel mm -hmm. is like completely different I think than than anything else in Turkey. It's almost I, I compare it almost a bit to to southern food in the United States. It has these kind they use a lot of corn mm -hmm. and and uh, cornmeal you know and and sort of um, they make these kind of stews that that remind me of sort of you know sort of soul food um, kind of you know uh, collard greens and kale you know things that you really find a lot in in the southern United States. I mean there's no connection historically but it's just interesting how it's very you know so it's very different kind of tasting food so um so and then in the Aegean uh the Greek influence is much more pronounced or and um uh you know the sort of seafood and and uh wild greens are a big part of 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 that so i mean i think you know as um as as uh you know getting out into those regions is, has always been quite interesting but again you come back to Istanbul, it's really possible without leaving Istanbul to, to really get a sense of a lot of that regional diversity. Now, it's not going to be fair before I uh, throw, throw it to questions. So wh what's your top three out of this book or ones that aren't in the book necessarily? Uh, places to eat. To eat, Like yes. specific? Yes. Uh, not so or hard. Can, we can no, no, not so that. hard. Not so hard. I, I, number one is a place called Chia. I mean, I, I, you know, not, not, they don't need any promotion from me because it's, yeah. it's a fairly well-known restaurant at this point. But it's, um, it's a great little spot on the Asian side in the Kadikoi neighborhood, sort of hidden in, in, in the market there. And uh, it's run by a chef named Musa, who's, who's from southeast Turkey. And he's a, a kind of a culinary anthropologist. I mean, he's a chef, but he's also really spends a lot of time exploring um, the countryside, collecting recipes, and it's a, just a fantastic restaurant, very simple place, you know, they kind of have prepared food on, a, you know, in pots, it's all ready to go. They also have a kebab restaurant across the street, but it's, uh, it's a place where I've most consistently had the kind of um, exciting, you know, culinary mm -hmm. um, gastronomic uh, experiences, you know, in terms of flavors, just kind of really I saying, I wow, I met you somebody know. in Aksaray who, uh, was hitting a soup house, and he described to me every aspect of the, the sheep. I mean, this was a sheep head yeah. soup, and, uh, <laughs> and everything that he used, and he was so uh -huh. passionate. Yeah, and he d described it in terms of divine grace and uh -huh. everything oh, from okay. the tongue to the eye, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, uh, and he's very passionate about uh, his 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 soup. Yeah. 
So that's number one, number two? Number one. Number two, um, I would say there's a, you mentioned the word esnaf. Esnaf is uh, uh, sort of the Turkish term for tradesmen. Or, and there's a, a type of restaurant called esnaf lokantas, uh, which is sort of workers' canteens or tradesmen's canteens. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one called Shaheen Lokantas, which is in Beyoğlu. And you know these are places, again, uh, they, it's like a cafeteria kind of. There's steam table. Uh, lots of things are prepared, but I, I just find the food there is is prepared with such incredible love and care. And you know, because these are places where the same customers come day to day, uh, you know, and it's almost like an extension of home. You know, mm. it's sort of like people can't go home to 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 eat their mother's cooking, so they go to this restaurant. So it needs to be as good as mom's. Mm. You know, so there's a lot of responsibility. So the food is always very good. And this place, Shaheen, is again a small place, always very crowded. Um, there's an amazing guy working behind the uh, the counter, sort of ladling things out. He works. He just works at a feverish pace. And uh, the food there is, is exceptional, I think. Mm. Um, and um, it's, a, it's the kind of place where I would go to every day. You mm. know, it's, and, and that's the point. You know, the idea is to bring you back every day. So there's always changing menu. You know, I mean, here in America, you know, there's sort of this you know, food movement now. And, and we talk of these concepts of seasonal and local. And you know, these guys have, do that naturally. It's not, you know, the, the menu changes every day. It's seasonal because there's no other option. Yeah. It's local because that's just how things need to be done. So it's, it's interesting. So this place really exemplifies that. Uh, so that's number two. Number three is um, a real hole in the wall. A uh, little place down, uh, also in the Karakoy area, which is uh, I mentioned before, down by the Bosters, and they serve something called tantuni, which is um, something that originates in Mersin, which is a city on the Mediterranean, southern Mediterranean coast, and it's um, th the closest I can compare it to is is sort of like it's almost like Mexican food. Uh, uh, if you've ever had a carne asada taco, which is j it's grilled meat that's rolled up in a, in a flatbread, a bit like a tortilla. It's not exactly the same. Um, but the way they do it, uh, tomatoes, onions, some spices, uh, the way it's made, I mean, it sounds very simple, but the flavor is, is, is really exceptional. It's a kind of, um, it's just sort of a perfect fast food, I find. Mm. And, and that's another thing. I mean, if I, if, I, if I could have one of those sort of every day in my life, I'd be very happy. Uh, so it's a very little hole in the wall, but it's the kind of place I, I re literally go to every day if I could. Mm. So. And you didn't mention any sweets, irrespective of, of the restaurants. Yeah. What's your favorite sweet and, and or restaurant that you know, serves sweet? Yeah. I mean, my favorite. Well, most people usually, when they think of Turkey, they think, Baklava. Yeah, they think baklava. Uh, I mean, the, the baklava is very good. I'm, I'm a great fan of the milky sweets, for example. But so my please. favorite sweet is um, something very seasonal, and it's uh, quince. Hmm, okay. uh, Iva tatlis, it's yep. called. And it's, you know, actually now is the season. Um, or a nice dollop of fresh cream with fresh clotted cream so you know it basically the <coughs> and and in the book here we I list the place that's my favorite place for this but you take a quince and you kind of half it and then it's uh roasted uh cooked um you know until the jelly turns this incredible sort of color that's it sort comes of out very bright orange well it depends yeah it can be it's sort of in between i find it's the color is sort of in between orange red garnet it's, yeah. a, it's a very you know incredible color and then um, on top of that is a dollop of kaimak, which is clotted cream made from buffalo, buffalo water buffalo milk, mm. we, um, called manda in Turkish, which is higher in fat. It has it's a very different kind of milk than yeah. than just cow's milk. So uh, so kaimak together with the the quince, I find, is a unbelievable combination. Truly, you know, it's sort of. Um, Kaimak in particular, I mean, just by itself is an amazing thing. I mean, people eat it for breakfast with honey, but I, I sort of describe it as the, uh, the official food of heaven. You know, if if there was a cafeteria in heaven, you know, this is all that would be served. You know, <laughs> sort of, just. Ekmek so tatlısı <laughs> and with kaimak. That's also very nice. Anything with kaimak, <laughs> really. So yeah. I'm getting very hungry. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have some here. <laughs> I was just. Uh, uh, telling Eagle he might have competition because I have so much experience eating in Istanbul. <laughs> I might, I might, I, I won't, of course. But uh, <laughs> a similar book would be useful. Definitely. Okay. The book's in Turkish too, by the way. Oh, okay. And and just uh, just I also want to say that we for, uh, it's it's in English and in Turkish, and we just um, it's out now in Korean too. 
We don't ask me why. Okay. Um, so and, English to and, English to but in Greek, we just um, it's just came out in Greek too, which I think is quite interesting because, f you know, a lot of Greeks are coming. You know, more Greeks now are coming and back to visit. In terms of tourism, I've seen a lot of increase. They they refer to as the 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 kind of the Arab season to get a lot of Middle Easterners yeah. of particular Arab descent. So yeah. there's a lot more. Uh, Arabic signs in Istanbul yep, popping up for sure, and a lot from the Farsi is Japan and uh, Korea. So Korea, I suspect so there you go. Okay, so maybe that somebody at the it. publishers yeah. knows this. Yeah. So let's take some questions from the audience. Mm. Otherwise, we'll be here, Eagle and I, speaking <laughs> about the food about for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Yes, at the back. Thank you very much. Um, this was really, really. Um, <laughs> Mouth-watering, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know Washington D.C. is a cultural crossroads as well. Yeah. And um, I am part of a movement here, 9/11 um, <coughs> Unity Walk, and we try to bring lay people together from all faiths and <coughs> no faiths and all cultures um, to walk every year down Embassy Row um, in unity, and uh -huh. we all learn something about each other's religions and backgrounds in the process. But then we, we decided we wanted to also use food as a way of bringing people together and building understanding. And we started a program called Diverse Cuisines. Huh. And we really want to find someone who's willing to teach Turkish cuisine um, as a way of bringing people together and maybe even talking about the diversity of Turkish cuisine and things like that. So if anyone here would be willing to teach that class for us, <laughs> we can deliver students for you. So, so. Um, I guess I don't have a question. Okay. I just wondered if you were in town for a while, we'd love to invite oh, you to come yeah, and teach. Yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. I, I live here <laughs> now, workshop. so yeah. But I don't know if I'm. I don't. You know, for the cuisine, it's. I mean, I'm good at talking about it. I don't know if I'm so good about. You know. Yeah. I mean, yes. you know how to how to how to make it is is a different thing. But, but I'm sure Emre must have oh, no, someone. Not anyway. you yourself, <laughs> but I'm sure Emre somewhat through uh, through the Rumi forum. But yeah. yeah so but we are trying to use food as a way of building understanding. Here yeah. In Washington, absolutely. DC, and maybe we can stay in touch. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Thank absolutely. You very much. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. <coughs> we have a question here at the front. Well, Just get the microphone to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry, but you can go. So, we'll have you next. Um, so your background, I understand now from when you said you, you cannot really teach cooking, but yeah. uh, you can talk about food. Right. So you, when you started this blog, you didn't know much about preparing food. Oh, it was no. I mean, I'm, I'm, can I'm you cook I and uh, I'm how yeah. I'm, so I'm, read the book I'm selling before. myself a bit short. Uh, I like to cook for yeah. sure, and. Um, you know, but I mean, I don't think you have to be a cook to to appreciate food. Um, I and mean, I don't mean chef cook is everybody. Yeah, but no, I, I, as a, as a home cook, I, yeah. I take things fairly seriously, and I do like to cook. And and um, and I you know I've always enjoyed cooking, especially cooking Middle Eastern food, um, Turkish to a certain extent. But I learned a lot while living there. But um, you know, but my experience was really more as an eater. A serious eater, let's say, uh, you know, in the sense that um, you know, I, 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 I take. Um, I, it sounds funny to say I take eating very seriously because that sounds a little too serious. But I mean, I, I, I very much appreciate what, what the people making the food are doing, and take it seriously in that sense, and um, and take the idea of ingredients very seriously, and take the idea of of, of the care that's put into making food very seriously. So in that sense. Istanbul was such a revelation and such a inspiration and such a joy to be in because there are so many people making food there who take what they do so seriously um, and do it with so much love and attention. So you know, if you're if you're somebody who who um, you know enjoys food, and I, some people don't. I mean, but you know, I think most of us do, of course. <coughs> but I mean, if you're somebody who enjoys food, then it, then there's so much to to enjoy there. Got a question here? Well, well thank you. Uh, Abraham Avidor, uh, retired foreign service. I have a couple of questions about uh, Washington, D.C. and Istanbul. Uh, the one about Istanbul, to what extent uh, the fast food uh, are um, making inroads and diverting the t Turkish public from their traditional cuisine into eating uh, where they are under pressure, work pressure, and so on. And also, if you could please comment on what types of bread the ekmek are popular or served in Turkish restaurants. As far as uh, Washington, D.C., um, 
because you mentioned Olivia, what is your favorite uh, Turkish restaurant here in, in D.C.? And when you go to so-called Middle Eastern eateries here, uh, what, what do you think about them? They serve sometimes falafel, which is too dry and so on. Okay. So uh, what do you think about the quality right. of food here yeah. in, in okay. the so-called Middle Eastern restaurants? Yeah, okay, sounds good. Um, so, I, I, well, first, I would. The fast food. Yeah, I mean, the fast food, you know, I think Emre mentioned this, you know, uh, you have, you know, perhaps the fastest growing fast food in Turkey right now is also the kind of most basic thing, which is simit, which is just this sesame ring. People know it's just a sesame bread ring. And it's the kind of thing that street vendors all over Istanbul, all over the country sell, you know, and it, 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 it's this kind of thing that you just pick up. It's cheap. It's tastes very good. It's, you know, somewhat filling, you know, for uh, as, as a snack. Um, so it's interesting that th this would be the fast food that's sort of really popping up all over the country. Um, but I think it's, it's in a certain way, you know, makes sense because it's very simple. Um, it's an affordable sort of thing. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, Donaire, which I mentioned, which is you know meat on a spit. I mean, you see those everywhere, and that's a kind of fast food um, that is very much a Turkish fast food, and that you see kind of all over the place. So there's really, in a way, there's no need to turn that into a fast food because it's been. I mean, it's a kind of slow fast food, and I think that's in a way the 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 beauty of a lot of of what you find in 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 Turkey is that you know there's there's been this fast food culture in the sense of people want to eat quickly and not get too bogged down um, but it has all the attributes of what you know we now call slow food which is you know sort of handmade and and you know kind of not part of a chain you know so so kofta back to grilled meatballs you know you have these meatball places all over the place and it's you know pretty fast food you know, I mean it doesn't take very long um, but you know it's it's handmade it's it's um, so I think you know Fast food, I mean, obviously you have McDonald's and Burger Kings and KFC and everything in Turkey, and those are popular the way they are popular in most countries around the world. But, you know, you kind of have this sort of indigenous, you know, fast food, quote unquote, um, uh, cuisine that, that um, you know, people very much appreciate and has, you know, all the sort of positive attributes of, of, of you know, sort of better made food than you know what what we think of as fast food which is really you know junk food so it's it's fast food that's not junk food i guess is the way to put it um the other question about bread i mean there's still you know i mean if you've been to turkey you know that i mean the kind of the most typical ekmek or bread is just kind of like a sort of white loaf looks a bit like a kind of fat baguette i guess you would say that's not a particularly interesting bread but it's not terrible and there's so many bakeries still i mean that's so um you know one of the things that's so nice about living in Istanbul, for example, is that there's always fresh bread available. You know, at every little corner market, every little sort of um, corner store has fresh bread that's sometimes coming twice a day. Um, but you know, in some neighborhoods, you know, you'll still find bakeries that are that are making flatbreads, pide, lavash, um, lavash, yeah, which is you know a, more, a kind of more thin flatbread. But you know, these are these are let's say like you know really nice wood fired <coughs> ovens, or you know some of them are gas fired, but you know a lot of places these are really nice brick ovens that are just turning out fresh flat bread that sort of comes throughout the day, especially f in areas where you have a lot of kebab restaurants. Um, so... And pide increases during Ramadan, it's a traditional Yeah, and during bread. Ramadan you have these very, you know, special pides made. So, yeah, I mean, bread, you know, I think you don't, you're not gonna, f I mean, there's not a great variety in terms of bread, you know, but, but what's made is, is, is a lot of times very fresh. Um, and then, locally, I'll tell you the truth, you know, I'm, I, I, I like to keep the the taste of of Istanbul in my mind and in in my you know in my mouth. So I don't really go so much to the Turkish restaurants here, just because mm. I find that um, it's hard. You know, having having after having eaten you know for all these years in Istanbul, uh, it's it's hard. I realize it's very hard to replicate what's done there. Just it's just it's, it's a sort of systemic problem just because of ingredients. You know the mm. the. Uh, you know, the lamb, for example, that you will find in Turkey, the, the flavor is just different. I mean, just because of the way it's grown and, you know, what they eat, perhaps, and um, the varieties. You know, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on you know, I mean, I'm, I, I know what I taste. I mean, I, so, you know, I just, I think, you know, so the, the produce, you know, I mean, what you find in Turkey, I think, is, is, is has just, I, it's just different, you know. So, um, 
so it's hard. It's, I find it's just hard to replicate. It's, no, it's not the fault of the people making the food here. You know, it's just something, it's a very hard thing to get by. There's um, Zetinia, which is you know, kind of a more upscale restaurant here uh, that the, you know, the celebrity chef Jose Andres runs. That, you know, they do food from Turkey and Lebanon and so sort of Eastern Mediterranean, Greece. Um, and you know, they do a very nice job in a certain way, almost like going there. I mean, it's a bit more of a night out. I mean, it's not, a, it's not an everyday kind of place, but you know, they're at least, you know, you know that they're not trying to make it exactly the way it's done in Turkey. It's a, it's a nice place, but you know, in terms of an actual Turkish restaurant, I, I don't really have a great place to recommend, I have to, I have to say. And with Middle Eastern stuff, I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's a, I, I don't know if, you know, if falafel is too dry. I mean, that's, you know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Well, usually, that's, that's the most <laughs> common question I get. They, uh, people ask me, uh, where's the best Turkish oh, but food? Oh, you know what? There's a, yeah. And you know what my answer is? My place. And your place, exactly. That's what I was going to say. Emre's but it's place. not open to, uh, unfortunately, there's the stage, on, not open to I, I live in Capitol Hill. There's a place on H Street, um, and, you know, which is this kind of emerging corridor that a Lebanese guy opened up called Shawafel, which I think is very good. If worth trying out. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. I should well, check I, out. I wanted also to ask about food regulation um, over there. Because we just got a question. We'll come back oh, to you. I was wondering if, if you've got um, going to you know some of the places that we really like, um, you know the restaurants that we really like, and and getting sort of favorite recipes from the chefs there. And it's just a lot of work. You know, we didn't realize. I mean, I think it's it's like a whole. You know, doing recipes properly and cookbooks, you know, it's, I, I think we, you know, we kind of thought this is going to be really easy, just go to the chef, get the recipe, but you know, you, you have to test it uh, to make sure that people can replicate it at home. You run in again into the problem of ingredients, you know, and so, um, so it was a great thing to start doing, but it just, we, it was more work than uh, we were sort of at this point wanting to do, but we'll probably come back to it because enough people have sort of said recipes would be really nice. Um, but there are a few really nice Turkish cookbooks out there uh, if you're interested <coughs> in recipes. Um, so, uh, but yeah, recipes is something we would certainly would like to do, but uh, it, it, it does take up a lot of time to do it properly, you know, because it's not fair to put out a recipe that's hard to, you know, replicate at home. And it's just a, you know, it's like a real tease, you know, it's not so, yeah. And spices? Spices. Um, I mean, in, in some Turkish restaurants, you'll sit down and, and there'll be actually like a trio, a kind of, uh, a sort of holy trinity of, of spices, which is, and they'll be in, in a kind of three, um, a, c a container that has three little little vessels, and there'll be sumac, which is a kind of uh, uh, tangy um, purple, in between purple and red. Um, it's made from a, a, a kind of um, almost like a berry um, uh, that's dried and powdered, and it, it ha it's tangy. It gives a very tangy flavor. Um, uh, Oregano, a kind of or oregano, um, and and then um, cumin. Yeah, and um, one more, and and then and then red pepper. I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes Bear, I'm yes, sorry. So yes. it's not a trinity. It's actually it's a it's four. So um, and so so the red pepper is flaked. It's sort of red pepper flakes made from dried red peppers. Mm -hmm. And you know, so you'll get your dish, and you can sort of you know add add those spices as you see fit. Um, so those four, it's true, four, um, is, are really, so pubiber is, is, is the Turkish word for the red pepper, sumak, uh, kekik, and then uh, cumin, which is um, kamon, kamon, yes? Yes, I think uh, so. Um, so those are really, you know, Turkish cuisine is not as, uh, you know, it's not as extravagantly spiced as like, say, Indian cuisine. Um, you know, it's it's really um, it's it's a lot of times it's about sort of the natural flavors of the food with you know a few sort of minimal spices in a way, but it's not you know it's not sort of so heavily spiced as as, as other you know other cuisines. And yeah, yes, yeah, another question. question. Yeah, I, I assume that the regulations about food security are more relaxed, and that's why you have all these street vendors selling boards, as you mentioned. Oh, uh huh. And it's like semits. I mean, yeah. Because here, I think that. It's, uh, you have more regulation. Yeah, I mean, I think in a certain way, I don't know so much about, you know, I know that, for example, we were actually talking about this earlier. One of the things we mentioned in here is something called chikofte, which is, um, it's sort of like the Turkish equivalent of steak tartare, let's say. It's, it's raw meat, as it's traditionally made, it's, it's raw, raw meat that's um, sort of pounded together with bulgur wheat and spices 
uh, some of these spices that we just talked about and then sort of made into and, 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 and it's sort of pounded and pounded and pounded kind of uh, kneaded not pounded kneaded it's a southeastern tur uh, until it turns into a kind of very very pasty kind of sticky paste and then made into little balls and they're eaten very tasty but you know it's made with raw meat so you know a lot of people now particularly with EU ascension right so exactly so, so th you know th uh, um, it's very popular but and there's a lot of it's actually one of the things that it's turning into a fast food thing in a way. You'll see mm. a lot of these little space places a of that, sell, that sell chikofte, chains that sell chikofte, but they make it without meat, right? It's just bulgur with, um, some people will use like a ground walnut and yeah. other kinds of nuts to, to create some, you know, the consistency. Um, but some places still serve it, the raw meat version. But, you know, if, if you go and to the- I don't care much for the EU. Well, <laughs> you know, EU, I mean, I don't know. The French are still making steak tartare. Nobody's yeah. told them to stop doing that, I'm sure, right? So, you know, I think the, uh, you know, I think it's just a lot of these, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more dicey with the raw meat. And I think a lot of maybe, a lot of the people have become a bit more squeamish about raw meat, so you know it's 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 perhaps convenient to blame it on the EU because I, I don't know if there's been an EU directive saying you know no more raw meat. But there was uh, something balls. like that regarding cockroach, and maybe you can tell yeah, our audience so, what cockroach is. and again, I you know these are things that need to be investigated properly because cockroach is is a dish that's that's um, it's grilled lamb's intestines, so uh, it's it's sort of lamb intestines that are wrapped around usually. Um, a gland, thymus glands. So I don't know if you've ever seen the inside of a baseball. And the inside of a baseball is sort of wound around. It's sort of rubber wound, wound around a core of maybe more rubber. I don't know what. Anyways, it looks. It, but it's like a loaf of hmm. wrapped and. Um, it's a street food, and um, some people really like it. I'm not the biggest fan of it, but but I've it's had a nice good place ones. In touch. Yeah, and uh, there's there's some very good and ones. Kanku. You know, but it always has a touch of that sort of funk of you know it's it's innards. I mean, you know, it's it's um, so. But again, this is the kind of thing where you know it, because it is, it has to really be very fresh. I mean, there's even you're a song, a pop song that made top ten. Yeah, cockroach senses all mars, which means okay. cockroach. Without you, we can't continue because exactly again, to do with the uh, e exactly. EU and so exactly. Change. So you know, but the cockroach is still there. I don't know. I mean, I think I think this is the, I, I sometimes I suspect this is a bit like uh, urban myths. You know, mm. people blame the you know it's like you know oh the EU made me do it. You know, um, so it's it's. Uh, uh, because these things are still being sold, you know, yeah. but, but I mean, I think in terms of, you know, uh, I think, like I said, you know, as, as Turkey is sort of, you know, as the economy develops and, and, and Istanbul in particular progresses, you know, I think there, there is, let's say, a bit of a crackdown on street vendors. It's not as loose as it used to be. Um, you know, that said, there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of pride in, in, in how people make food there that, that you very rarely see, you know, sort of filthy, I don't know, you know, <coughs> just, there's a kind of pride that people take. And even these street vendors, uh, you know, uh, I talked about the raw meatballs and there's, in, in here we, we sort of profile two, two different places that make it. One is a proper restaurant and one's a guy in a cart. And he goes around the city in a cart. He doesn't do it with the raw meat anymore because he doesn't have refrigeration. Um, but he sells it from a cart and, and you should just see how, you know, he wears a white, sort of a white robe kind of, you know, he almost looks like a pharmacist. And um, yeah, he has this beautiful cart. It's well decorated, well lit. It just, you know, it's, I, would, I would eat from it, you know, hmm. happily. Um, so I don't know, I, I, I sort of trust, you know, I trust, I trust the self-regulation in Turkey. Yeah, more than here. I mean, I, I mean, more than here. You know, not. I, I think there's just a strong tradition, so I, I, I trust it. You know, and I've never, I've never, uh, never had any. I've bad never fallen sick in the. You just drink your iron and then you're. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. In the tw Twenty years <laughs> I've been coming and going <laughs> right, to Turkey. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah. And I've eaten in many in weird and wonderful places of, yeah. across Turkey. Yeah. Uh, have we got uh, any other questions from the audience before we? Yes. One more. Which dishes would you recommend for vegetarians in Istanbul? Ah, uh, there's so much. I mean, it's hard to. Uh, um, I mean, there's pide, which is sort of you know sort of loosely termed Turkish pizza, but it's kind of dough, oven baked, you know, usually kind of a sort of a canoe-shaped thing that's done 
oftentimes without meat, you know, cheese, cheese. and other vegetables, and that's a very nice thing. You know, when you go to, I mentioned these. Kuru fasulye. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to say kuru fasulye, which is beans, you know, sort of like kind of like that's Turkish style of baked beans. But, you know, when you go to these asnaflo kantas, which I mentioned, these workers' canteens, and you'll have, you know, 20 something dishes kind of prepared and among those there'll be so there's lots that's done with vegetables without meat so it's not just kebab you know I mean kebab is is I you know I think very much associated with turkey but there's so much more um, so yeah I mean there's I mean it's almost uh, there's so much too much to, to you know to to sort of and describe category uh, that's usually referred to as zeytinyağlı things made yeah. out of olive oil yeah so yeah, and it's you know, meze, meze rest, you know, usually a lot of meze, meze, you know, the sort of, in, there's restaurants that specialize, mehanes, which are these restaurants that, that specialize in, you know, small dishes, you know, meze. And a lot of those are usually vegetarian, egg, egg, maybe egg fish. is very popular in yeah. Turkish cuisine, yeah. so you have a, a lot of uh, eggplant-based foods, whether it's eggplant and meat or eggplant on its own mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. it's really a matter of hitting this book, I suspect, to... Uh, yeah find out yeah. all the uh, yeah. nice places yeah. as I will there's only a few that I knew about myself yeah. and we also have an app now so which is if you, you know if, which is helps if you don't want to if you don't want to buy the book you can you can also try the app and they'll take you Scott the app yeah the app you know has all the places in the book uh, and more because it has everything that we have on the website now mostly and it also has a mapping feature so for example if you're you know, if you're <laughs> if you're like standing on the corner of, you know, uh, somewhere in the in the in the in the Istiklal, heart of Istan yeah. of Istanbul, and you want a fish restaurant, so you can do, sort of do fish nearby, and yep. and the mapping will will take you to the nearest fish restaurant. So, anyways, well, the app, app is app. well, it's IstanbulEats.com is the website. It's no, no, but app for the iPhone? app, yeah, the app is for uh, iPhones. It's yeah, an iPhone app, so yeah. What is the name of Istanbul, that? well, yeah, Istanbul Eats. If you okay. go to the App Store, look under Istanbul okay, Eats. Okay, we'll uh, end on that note yeah. then. Uh, if we can thank uh, Yigal for his thank uh, you. Yeah. great chat.